Between 1998 and 2007, the rate of growth in our local economy was second only to that of London, and since 2007, the economy here has declined at a much greater rate compared with all other regions, with the exception of Yorkshire and the Humber. Since the economic downturn, the South of Ireland and Britain have seen real output fall by 3%. There has been some further improvement since, but still no real sustainable economic recovery. But the performance, <coughs> excuse me, but the performance of the local economy has been far worse than that of either the South or in Britain. Our local e economy has contracted by roughly 12% since the crisis began. Now, as a committee and as an assembly, we accept that we need to explore every avenue towards economic recovery and ensure that we build a just, fair and sustainable economy for all of our citizens. And while there are some recent signs of recovery and growth, our economy still has much catching up to do to get back to where we were before the downturn. And yesterday it was revealed that um, for the 15th month in a row, um, the number of people claiming unemployment benefit fell for the 15th consecutive month. And that, that's it's very welcome news. But behind those statistics, I believe that um, our economy is still dominated by emigration, by underemployment, um, by zero-hour contracts, um, by rising levels of self-employment self and low pay. So the issue of sustainable economic growth is therefore a very important one for us. The Committee for Enterprise, Trade and Investment is always looking for new ways to build and grow a sustainable economy. We are also interested in improving the range of reliable information which we can access and utilise to measure and understand our economy. And with that in mind, I very much look forward to hearing the contributions of both our speakers today. And it's with great pleasure that I hand over to our first speaker, Dr Sandra Moffat from the University of Ulster. In building a sustainable economy, we strive to create organisations that are efficient, cost-effective, um, have conducive learning environments, um, value their employees so the employees feel appreciated, um, and build on the reputation of the quality of goods and services that they offer. A lot of these initiatives came from the concept of the learning organisation. Peter Senge outlined this has five main features, including systems thinking, personal mastery, mental models, shared vision, and team learning. Now, the idea that everyone is going to come to work in every organisation with, filled with passion, caring about what happens to that organisation, seeing this shared vision, all singing from the same um, hymn sheet, so to speak, is in a way very evangelistical. It's not the, you know, what happens in real life. Some people simply want to come, get their wages and go home. So I think we have to appreciate that within organisations. The um, concept of knowledge management actually came to the fore around 1997 in a way of how to operationalise the learning organisation. So while the ideal um, situation was there, sort of, yes, we would all like to, to you know, be in um, learning organisations and work for organisations that appreciate their staff and, and provide conducive environments for knowledge exchange and sharing, how to do that was a challenge for organisations. So Davenport outlined um, that uh, knowledge management is really about the process of capturing, developing, sharing, and effectively using organisational knowledge. Basically, it's getting the right information to the right people at the right time. And I would go so far as to say actually having the right people is what the crux of it is. Because if you've got the right people in a situation, they will try and find the information that they need. We are an information survey um, culture. Now, if you look at the literature around knowledge management, I did a quick Google last night, typed in the keywords knowledge management, and over 4 million hits came back. So there's a vast amount of information out there on this subject. Um, that has really came because of the different elements that can contribute to the subject. So there is a computer science element, there's a business element, there's sociology, there's psychology, there's human resource management. Um, you know, there's a wealth of material that can um, fit into and actually extract from the subject of knowledge management. So it's just sort of a word of caution that if you're looking at this, you really do have to look through the literature for the key nuggets of information that are there. As part of my PhD, I want to sort of take you back to 1997, um, when I was doing my PhD, we had sort of looked at the literature and we tried to categorise it as to key elements. 
So um, sort of within the macro environment, we looked at what we meant by economic information, what technical um, aspects there was to, to consider there. Now, bear in mind, this was the time when the internet was really just exploding into our organisations. We looked then at also the social agents of change, globalisation, um, partnerships, alliances, markets, the rise of the economy, etc. So there was something around the macro environment external factors that impact on internal factors and processes in the organisation. We then looked at organisational climate, and that's very much sort of the culture of the organisation, the structure, what strategy organisations have in pla place, um, how their employees feel, what type of reward systems are in place, really getting down to the, you know, um, how does this organisation work, what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis um, that gives us that sustainability. We then looked at the technical infrastructure um, and the response to technical change, so really looking at the architecture of um, technology that organisations have in place. And we then took that to a, a secondary level, looking at the tools that people use, how standardised are our technology um, systems within organisations, um, how usable is the technology that we have, do um, employees have to learn new ways of working to be able to cope with the technology that's in place? Or do we actually have user-centred technology and um, where people can you know, easily get to grips with what's happening? So we'd sort of looked at the whole idea of what we mean by knowledge tools. We looked then at information. Um, looking at information fatigue, you know, how do people feel with this whole idea of information overload? Is there an abundance of information where we simply have too much information in our organisations? We can't see the wood for the trees. Or is it that the information um, is lacking? So therefore, we have the tendency to duplicate, to recreate what we can't find. We think it doesn't exist because it's held in some knowledge silo somewhere, and therefore we're impacting on our systems by simply adding more and more and more, and um, causing even further confusion. Finally, we looked at the personal attributes. What's in it for me? Why should I share my knowledge? Why should I give you know, my expertise to colleagues? Why should I capture this in a system? Um, what's the added advantage for me to st maybe take you know, 10 minutes out of the end of my day to capture what has happened that day, to have an information trail um, on some system? So very much looking at the um, empowerment of employees, the concepts of learning and sharing through knowledge networks, communities of practice, dialogue um, and innovation. How can we be more innovative in our working practices? To visualise that then, um, as part of my PhD, I created the MECTEP model. And this is really just a way of sort of visually capturing the text around that. So the macro environment in some way impacts on what's happening to the organisation's internal climate. So say, for example, if we consider um, the internet. You know, when the internet first came around, the um, macro environment, the technology aspect impacted on the culture of the organisation, how people used the technical architecture, and how they actually um, impacted that in terms of their everyday jobs through technical information and personal processes. The propositions are just testing the relationship, so I'm not going to go into that today, but um, as part of my PhD, we did carry out some statistical information to test these and to test the validity of the model. So, in terms of doing that, what we did um, was a follow-up survey to my PhD. Um, whenever I was doing PhD, people were sort of going, knowledge management? Seriously, there's really no subject there. This is something that we've always been doing. There are, all of our organisations are learning organisations or they wouldn't be still existing. So in 2009, we received an external research grant in order to sort of have another look at what the landscape was for knowledge management implementation across the, um, the UK. We created a survey in order to do that. The survey is still live at the moment, so I'm happy enough for anyone who wants to use that survey in their own organisations. Um, we've had it used where people have carved it up and used it as interviews or, or just maybe as discussion forums. So I'm happy to chat to you about different ways that you could use that tool um, if you wish. We created a database of 4,709 records. 
why that number? I don't know. It was just sort of the, the, as many as we could get at that time that sort of had business improvement initiatives because we felt that these would be more savvy and open to the concept of knowledge management. From that, we um, extracted a sample of 2,000 and we received 588 responses, around sort of a third, 29%. Not great, but was still workable. Um, we asked people to sort of complete the survey, and it was a very detailed survey, um, but to do that because they had an interest in the subject, because they wanted to you know, express their views, we didn't offer any rewards. So it wasn't like, do this and you get 50 quid of Marks and Spencer's vouchers. It was simply we wanted them to do it because they had an interest. So in a way, sort of our responses we got back were quite detailed, um, and we were able to use a lot of, of um, the information from them. When we classified those into categories, 2% um, were deemed to be beginners at knowledge management, so they had very little KM implementation in place, or they weren't seeing it as knowledge management um, activity. 14% were deemed to be laggards, in that they, were, um, they maybe had some implementation, but they scored low on two of the aspects, either information technology or personal aspects. 11% had um, received a high score in one of the elements, so they were deemed as non-viewers. They knew that they had to do something, they were doing something, but they weren't really seeing the long-term impact of their initiatives, and they weren't maybe you know, promoting it as part of a learning culture within the organisations. 59% were seen as emergers. These were um, organisations that were you know, doing well on two of the initiatives, but still had a, a long way to go. 13% were progressors, high in one category, and disappointingly, only 2% were deemed as achievers, so sort of receiving high scores in all three elements. Um, and that was a bit of a shock, to think that across the UK, out of 588 organisations, only two could be seen as being you know, high achievers in terms of um, technology, information, and people aspects. So that led us to sort of question then what was happening in organisations. So we conducted some in-depth case studies um, to give us more insight into what was actually happening. Um, these have been ongoing. We sort of started our interview processes around 2011 and we have you know, worked with a vast number of organisations through the public sector, through um, private sector organisations, and also non-profit organisations. So I have just extracted some quotations to sort of give you a flavour of what is coming through in terms of um, implementation. Recession, not to be ignored. Um, I think everyone is conscious at the moment that we are, you know, in, in the downturn. We're not sort of rising out of it as we probably had anticipated we would um, early on. One of the quotes there, you know, trouble comes in reception when you have 150 million pounds of fleet depreciating at 50 million per year and it's sitting doing nothing. So some of our organisations have been very hard hit by the recession. Um, you know, I don't, we don't have the capacity to sort of look at new markets. We, we're just trying to keep our heads above water at the moment was another sort of mantra. Secondly, what came out, though, was that within Northern Ireland, in a way, we've probably been very cautious in terms of the recession. And this may be because of our economy is built from small, medium-sized enterprises. So we're more um, nearly family businesses. We're more focused on, on what it is. Um, and we've just sort of haven't been making rash decisions. Those that have probably you know, went bankrupt in the first year or so. But the caution has been you know, sort of um, key for a lot of our organizations that hold them back. Let's sort of concentrate on where we are now, you know, look to the future, but not jump with a leap of faith came across. Value for money, very much, and that's across sort of the you know, private, public and non-profit, really conscious to think of um, what we're giving people for in terms of our quality goods and services, um, appreciating our customers and trying to sort of give them value for money, trying to work smarter, cheaper, more efficient. So the whole sort of lean um, aspect comes into play. How can we cut the fat and just really have our core business? 
Conservatism, steady hand has paid off now. Um, some organisations entered the recession very much in a healthy position. They had a store um, of capital and, and you know, felt that now was a good time for them to sort of impact on, on that and become more innovative. Um, knowledge management was identified as some core themes within organisation, starting to look really at what people um, do, what is happening in the external market, sort of scanning what competitors do, cherry-picking best practice and bringing that back into um, our own organisations. And also maybe planning more for future innovation. How can they you know, sort of be more innovative and creative in the future? In terms of organisational climate, um, we sort of looked at the strategy. One company says our strategy, simply to survive, to grow, build up the business and make money. And if we do that, you know, we're, we're, that's us, that's, that's what we want to do. The question was whether they needed to jot that down on paper. You know, there was some um, question about having a strategy, you know, what was the value of having, you know, an annual strategy when very much, you know, it could be in firefighting mode, something happens and, and the organisation has to react. So flexibility was key. Communication also came up as um, an issue within organisations, and this was in terms of face-to-face -face communication, but also how to use virtual communication. You know, um, is there a need if you're a small organisation to have, you know, an IT system? Can you capture things manually? Is that sufficient? So a lot of information and questions, I suppose, can arose around that subject. And also um, being visible, you know, having transparency. Um, organisations felt that it was time to sort of, you know, hold their hands up and, and show what was going on, you know, to engage more with their employees and to actually get input from internal rather than sort of looking externally for solutions. In terms of the technical climate then, knowledge capture um, was one of our issues, sort of how do we capture what's the best type of information, um, how do we get that onto our systems, what sort of systems should we have, how can we get system integration. They also considered embedding, so, you know, sort of there's initial excitement, you know, we get a new system or we get a new toy to play with, you know, everybody's, you know, um, enthused with it, and then we sort of get complacent, things go back to the way they are. So there was questions about how to keep that vibrancy within the organisation, and also how to scale that up. You know, coming from small to medium-sized enterprises, um, we have a tendency to maybe put in more, more cost-effective um, systems at the start, and then there's a problem of how you bolt on to that. And the add-ons and purchasing new systems maybe didn't fit really well with what was already there. So there's quite a bit of discussion around the scalability for information storage, share, and application. We looked at some of the tools that organisations use. I think for me, what, was, what really struck me was in terms of when we looked at administration staff, um, most administrators weren't even aware of the complexity of words. So when we're sending, well, you know, do you do mail merge? They were like, no, how do you do that? Or, you know, looking at spreadsheets, how, how, you know, how do you build in macros? So just even the tools that we take for granted every day are not really being used to their full potential. So there may be an issue around some training in terms of that. We looked at how um, organisations acquire knowledge, um, you know, the boundaries scanning, how do they sort of use their networks. Again, communication came up as key and part of that. You know, so now that we've got email, we're able to connect um, virtually. And most people sort of had the dependency on sort of having tools and email and things like that for communication. Um, at one stage we went in and we turned off the email system in a few companies and after the, the shock horror for the first you know, sort of half an hour, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, it was interesting to see how people actually got up and walked to the person at the next desk to ask the question. So you know, I think we do have a dependency on the technology but we have to remember that it's simply an enabler, it's a tool to use and it's not sort of what our businesses are based on. Security came up as another um, issue, very much sort of looking at more so as people are starting to work from home, you know, or, or connecting sort of in the evenings onto um, internal systems, what security should be in place in order to protect the data. And there was a bit of a quandary between how to have open information within organisations and then how to protect, you know, your baby. You, you know, we need to have sort of um, some information, some um, 
data that the people simply can't get access to. Business intelligence seemed to be an issue where people were saying, well, yeah, you know, I'd love to be able to sort of do knowledge management and not data mining and, you know, to look at our trends from the past and allow that to shape our future. But they just weren't aware of how to actually get the nugget, knowledge nuggets, as it was called. What's the, the key things that we should be looking at in order to drive um, our organisations in the future? So in terms of information then, very much um, sort of looking at the ca capture and dissemination of information, content management systems, the whole lot issues around how do we ensure that things are up to date, that we've got the right information, that people aren't duplicating the information. Um, should we have an information strategy and how effective can that be within the organisations? Um, how much do we depend on this document and um, that may, we may can take some organisations say, you know, perhaps a year or so actually writing the strategy and what's the validity of that at, um, whenever it's completed. Looking at information um, overload, and I thought it was one interesting quotation where, where um, one person said, well, people are used to this in their personal life. There's data smog everywhere, you know, um, we are information savvy, we use our devices, you know, we have maybe three or four different um, devices on the go at one time. Is information overload really a challenge for us now or are we simply becoming more um, aware of information and we are using the tools smarter so therefore maybe it's not um, such an issue anymore. In terms of people then we looked at sort of the organisational culture and how people felt valued looking at the welfare of, of um, people very much, you know, people see us as a good employer, there's tendency not to move, as opposed to um, cultures where maybe people felt that if you didn't move, you know, within, you know, the first three years that you, you were tied. So there is a thing, sort of, as people are getting more and more educated, um, there's a, a tendency to move around organisations to job hot, to sort of develop your skills. So this lifelong learning is it having an impact on how, um, you know, people respond to the organisations that they work with. They want to work for a good employer, but they want to move on um, pretty quickly as well. It was interesting as well, sort of uh, where the leadership came out as being crucial. Peter Seng outlines that you know, two good organisations do two things. One, they hire a good leader. Two, they constantly look for his or her replacement. So I think within organisations, people were looking for that leadership. They wanted to be inspired and they wanted their leader to be a knowledge champion and to actually encourage them um, to, you know, look at external sources of information, to bring the information back, giving them the freedom and the flexibility to risk take in a way, to sort of be a bit more averse to exploration um, in terms of the working practices. Flexibility. Um, should people have flexible working practices? There were some arguments around that. Um, should they be, you know, are they more productive or that when they're in the office and they can collaborate with colleagues? Or, you know, is it acceptable for organisations to allow their employees working from home? And I think that very much came through from the public sector where maybe there's not the... Um, history of allowing people to sort of stay at home and have location-based working and that's starting to change now. So there's some interesting discussions around that. Um, team working, I think people realise that we don't work in isolation anymore. We tend to work in teams. Um, there was this concept of mentoring going on within organisations and that very much came from the idea of having succession planning. So there was pe key people in organisations who maybe were moving on or retiring um, and, and there was a gap there. Organisations had maybe missed out on a lot of the knowledge that should have been captured but wasn't and they only realised that after the person had gone. So I think that you know, a lot of our companies are starting to think of succession planning, what's going to happen um, when our employees do move on. So within the literature then, there is an evidence that knowledge management is now sort of coming to fruition as a, a subject in its own right, as a way to influence um, the strategies and operations of our, our current organisations and really sort of being looking at it, you know, it's not necessarily a fad. Personally, I don't like the term knowledge management. I think it's an oxymoron that you can't really manage knowledge if we're looking at the personal aspect of it. 
Um, some organisations would prefer to re refer to it as continuous improvement or continuous innovation, which I think is a better concept. But whatever the term is um, in use within the organisations, the core concepts are still there, that we need to be you know, working smarter, working more effectively and more efficiently. The challenges then for our organisations is that most do not manage their knowledge well. You know, we do have knowledge silos. We're not really au fait with what's happening in our IT systems. We have systems that the information is out of date, databases that have maybe been redundant, but no one wants to remove it. So there are some issues around content management and how do we have, um, you know, the best information available. We also considered then how we lose knowledge through downsizing and, and staff turnover and this whole lack of succession planning. We tend to buy an expertise that already exists, um, reinventing the wheel very much, knowledge capture and sharing. There's a tendency to want to capture um, the glory stories. You know, what have we done well? How can we promote that? And that was one of the difficulties with some of the organisations who maybe weren't doing so good. Um, when it came to actually publishing, they were like, no, 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 don't be saying that about us. You know, we don't want the public to know that we've went and lost X amount of pounds on that project or whatever. So, you know, we're not very good at sort of holding our hands up and being risk, um, you know, sort of adverse and, and taking that on board. There's also sort of um, a quandary as to how to apply knowledge management. So, you know, while we can look at this from an academic subject and look at the theory, actually putting it into practice can be difficult for organisations. And it's not a quick win solution. You know, you really have to look at what is applicable for that organisation at that particular moment in time and just be flexible and ready and open for change. Um, technical and social barriers, I think we sort of assumed at the start that everyone was going to be um, technology savvy at the moment and, you know, that we were all willing to work in teamwork or whatever. And actually, when you, you get into some organisations, that wasn't the case. You know, a lot of the organisations are still not connected to the internet, you know, which is surprising in a way. Um, they're also a fear of what they don't know. So therefore, the, the fear of the unknown came through. People were saying, well, yes, yes, we know, you know knowledge management is very crucial to us. We know that we have to do something. We're not really sure what to do, but we're just going to put, you know, we're going to invest money in this anyway. And we're maybe investing in buying another piece of technology or in putting another bolt onto their system that wasn't given any extra benefit. So there was that quandary as to where investment should be made um, for KM implementation. So in terms of the strategy, I don't know if you can have one particular strategy for knowledge management. It's not like a recipe. You know, um, my husband's a chef, and when he comes home in the evenings, he can go to the cupboard, pick out three or four ingredients, and, and there's a meal. I look at it and think there's nothing to eat. You know, so I think for organisations, they need to have that sort of skill set where they're able to pick the key ingredients and put them together at that specific time to make an impact. So um, there's lots of words there. We simply have to sort of um, work with each organisation in its own remit. So thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.